Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Luke in chapter 11. <coughs> Luke in chapter 11. Or sorry, 18. Luke in chapter 18. And if you can keep your thumb on Psalm 121, <coughs> maybe go fishing for it. Um, Psalm 121. I'm going to preach today on will you lift up your eyes? Will you lift up your eyes? It's a question. Reading from Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. <clears throat> and he, Jesus, spake, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And it says in Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He will not keep it. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, Lord God, I ask you that you, uh, Lord, provide us, Lord, understanding of what your word is saying to us, oh Father. Lord, help us to write it on the table of our hearts, oh God. Lord, help us, oh God, to sincerely listen, oh God, and hear, Lord, that we would be those that have ears to hear, Lord, as your son spoke about all throughout his word, oh God, that we would have eyes to see, oh God, Lord, that in these last days, oh God, Lord, you'd prepare our hearts, oh God, Lord, to be ready, oh Father, Lord, for what's to come, oh God, and by doing so, by cleaving unto your word, oh God, by under understanding unto your word, O God. How else are we supposed to cleanse our ways, O God, but adhering to that word of God? Lord, I ask you, O God, Lord, help us, O God, to respect it, to value it, O God. Lord God, to magnify, Lord, your word, O God, and what you have to say to us, O God. Lord, I ask you, Lord, speak to us here this afternoon, O God. Minister your truth to us in a, in, a, in a remarkable way, O oh God. Lord, speak to us in a way, O oh God, that lingers with us for the week, O oh God. Lord, for this preacher included, O oh God. Lord, that you'd help me, O oh God, Lord, to preach truth, O oh God, and that that truth would be in my heart, O oh Father. Lord, I just ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Pour out your spirit upon us here this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> you know, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, Chapter 3, you don't need to turn there. It says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And in verse 7, it says, A time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to rend, which is to cut up, a time to sow, which is to put back together, a time to silence and a time to speak. I'm preaching here today. Will you lift up your eyes? Because we read of here in this parable about a lowly publican. It says, would not lift up his eyes so much unto heaven. Why? Because he was downcast. He did not think that he was worthy to stand before God. And he rightly understood that. But we can't stay there, saints of God, and that's what I want us to preach today. That is an important starting ground. That is an important place to start for us as believers. And we must always keep an attitude of lowliness, we must always be small in our own eyes. But there is going to come a day when you have to stand and you have to look onto that hill from whence cometh your help. To look up, he says, I lift up my eyes. So there's a right time to look down, but there is a time when we have to say, so far and no further. I am lifting up my eyes to that hill. Why? Because that's where our help comes from. Amen. I agree that 
We have to be lowly. I agree that we want to be humble. I think, and we look at this here today, we, those are important and vital parts of the Christian life. It's not possible to be a Christian without them. But there comes a time where in righteous indignation must come up at seeing what the enemy of our souls has done in our lives, our homes, our city, our churches across the land, our workplaces, our unsaved family members, and saying there has to be more than this, and saying and a time to stand up and to be counted. So will you lift up your eyes? That's the question I'm posing to you here today. Will you lift up your eyes? In this parable, we're told about two men in the temple praying. One's a Pharisee and one is a publican. One is from the upper crust of Judean society and the other is the lowest of the low. This Pharisee trusts entirely in himself and nothing else. His boast is in his own righteousness. His boast is in his own righteousness, whereas the publican's trust is in God and God alone. I think it's fitting that our brother Paul shared this morning about God kicking out all of those elements of self-righteousness from us. I'm going to show you here today that to look up to the hill from whence cometh your help, that's not a point of self-righteousness. That's not from a place of boasting or being, or being, um, or being self-assured, but it's from a place of Believing that God's glory is greater than your own inability. His ability to do great, abundantly and mighty in your life, in this city, in our homes, is far superior than where you are, uh, the where you feel you are in your Christian walk. And I want us to first look at here who Jesus is speaking to here. Because it says specifically in verse 9, and he, that is Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. There was a clear purpose for Jesus telling this parable and it was for a specific audience. This audience trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This word trusted in Greek is patho and it's elsewhere almost in equal measure translated as persuaded. Simply put, this Pharisee was, pers or these people that Jesus was telling this parable to, they were persuaded of their own righteousness. They were persuaded of what? That they were justified by their goodness. That by being good people, by keeping the law, by fasting twice in the week, by not being like this publican, that they were justified in the eyes of God. How do I know that they thought they were justified? Because Jesus specifically calls out that the publican went home justified. This other man did not, yet he thought, <clears throat> yet he thought that he was. They trusted and were persuaded of their justification by their own ability to follow the law of God as their source of faith. Simply put, their source of faith was their ability to walk with God, their ability to not be a, an extortioner, to not be unjust, not to be an adulterer, not to be a publican, and yet their attitudes stank. They were haughty. They had no real charity. They had no love. If you read about what this Pharisee says, he says, I'm not like this publican. That suggests to me that that publican was within earshot of him. He was looking at the publican and he saw him and he thought, I am better than you. You're a bad man. And yet he was so unaware of his own rottenness. Jesus called these very men whitewashed sepulcher. What is that? It means it's beautiful on the outside. To be whitewashed it means it's covered in a lime wash that's white and it looks absolutely pristine on the outside the only problem is it's a tomb it's a place where people go to die that sepulcher is something that houses dead bodies something that's not alive not even in the physical never mind in the spiritual and that's what it looks like to be self-righteous, to be self-assured, to be persuaded of your own goodness. It says in the book of Romans in chapter 3, verse 20, By the deeds of the law there were no flesh, sorry, by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight. By the deeds of the law, that means by doing the law, no flesh is going to be 
justified in his sight. What does that mean? By being a good person, you are not going to make it to heaven. By following the law of God, you will not get to heaven. Nobody except Jesus Christ could stand in front of God and say, by my own righteousness, should you let me into that heavenly kingdom? Nobody. Jesus Christ did. He overcame death. The reason he was able to be raised was because he lived perfectly sinlessly. And what these men are claiming to be is as, as, as sinless as Christ. Saints of God, this should not be named among us. We do not want these things in our lives. We don't believe in our own righteousness. Anybody that I believe has walked with God for any length of time will understand that if you trust in your own righteousness, you're on shaky ground. If you trust in your own ability to keep regular prayer or to read the Bible or to come to meetings or to listen to Keith Malcolmson or to get, pay your tithes or to fast on a regular basis, if those things are the source of your trust, you're in big, big trouble here today. If the source of your trust is that you listen to good preaching, you don't listen to Joyce Myers, you don't listen to Kenneth Copeland, you don't listen to Joel Osteen, if that's the source of your trust, you're in big, big trouble. The only thing that I, the only way, the only thing that persuades me that I am justified by God is the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. I have been washed in the blood of Jesus. He has cleansed me in the blood and he does not remember my sins anymore. I might think about them. Do you ever think about what you did in your old life, not telling anyone and just cringe visibly? I could be sitting there at my computer and work and something just crossed my mind and I will physically cringe at thinking about what my life was like outside of Christ. Some of us even cringe about things that we've done since we came to Christ and yet the blood of Jesus covers it all. That blood washes you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness and I'm grateful for that sin. I'm grateful to that blood because it's better than any solvent. The Bible says that though your sins be as scarlet, he made them white as snow. That word scarlet, a special dye that was added to linen fabrics or any fabric at the time and once it was in, it wasn't coming out. Anyone that's ever spilt red wine on something white will understand it's almost impossible to take out. And same with blood. And yet the Bible says, our sins were so stained that nothing could remove it. Yet the blood of Jesus, that new covenant, God himself sent his son to die, that his body was broken for you. He poured out his blood and now you don't need to stand on your own righteousness. Those people who are going to Mass and the Ramadan has just been over. Those Muslim, Muslims has, have finished 30 days of intermittent fasting, fasting from sunrise to sunset, uh, and they think that warrants favor with God. The hypocrisy of it all, that during the day they don't smoke, and yet uh, in the evening you can see them all just, they can't get enough of their cigarettes because God seemingly is fine with it in the evening, but not during the day. You see, the reason they do that is because Islam is a bloodless, religion there is no blood to wash them and atone for their sins they do not have an atonement how do I know they don't have an atonement because they it is a sin for them to say that they're going to heaven it is actually a mortal sin you cannot say that anybody is going to heaven because you're a man or a woman you're earthly and so they believe that's a sin what does that tell me there's no atonement the reason that you have a blessed assurance is not just because of the word of God it's not just because you uh, you feel forgiven because God help us if your feelings before God is the basis of your faith you're in big big trouble but the reason you can know that you have that blessed assurance that you're going to heaven is because the blood of Jesus because Jesus shed his blood because Jesus atoned for your sin that means you were sinful and God covered your sin with his own precious blood and so that's upon that is the basis upon which we stand it is that Jesus died on a cross for us and he had mercy on us and he cared for us and he loved us and because of the love of God he's washed us clean and, and cleansed us Saints of God, I can't tell you the innumerable times that throughout my Christian life I have come back to the blood time and time again. I've messed up, come back to the blood. I've made a mess of it all week, come back to the blood. I've done something that is unforgivable, yet you come back to that blood and that, that, that fountain never dries up. We sing that song, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, all 
every single thing. Whatever you've done this week, come back to the blood. Put it underneath the blood. The blood in the physical body washes out all toxins. It's used to excrete all impurity from all of those cells and from the physical body, from the spiritual body. It's that blood of Jesus. If there's anything else that you stand upon here today, you're on very, very shaky ground. And can I tell you from experience, very shaky ground. And so these people, they trusted. This is who he's talking to. We haven't even gotten to the Pharisee yet. But the people that he's telling this parable to, they trusted in them, their own righteousness and they despised others. You know, it says in, uh, later on in Romans 3, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Oh, you know, I've, uh, uh, I heard Brother Stephen Riddle preaching recently. I mean, he might have said it even while he was here. <clears throat> and he said, you know, sometimes when he was first saved, people were asking him, uh, so what's it, like to, what's it like being saved? Uh, what do you do now that you're a Christian? And all he would do is just list the things of, oh, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do the other, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chase, carouse women, I don't do this. And someone said, what, what do you do? It sounds like you just don't do anything. What do you do? And saints of God, there's an element to that where we must be like those people in the Song of Solomon. When they came to the Shulamite, they said, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? And she said, my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is like the most fine gold so she was not saying that to love this man means I'm rejecting all other men but first and foremost she said this man this shepherd I love him so much this is what it's like and that Christian life if someone asks you what do you do you worship God you live for him we've put all of our sins behind us but if the basis of your faith is I'm a Christian because I don't uh, drink anymore and because I don't smoke weed anymore and I don't go to nightclubs anymore and I don't like candles anymore that's not what it means to be a Christian there are sinners out there that don't do any of the things I've just listed, but it doesn't make them Christ-like. It does not make them Christians. And same with these men. They lived uprightly and righteously, yet they totally missed the mark. This Pharisee was more righteous than any of us sitting in this room. Jesus himself said, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of these Pharisees, you are not getting into the kingdom. You might say, how is that possible? By the blood of Jesus. These men were righteous in their own eyes. And they were righteous indeed, yet righteousness in and of itself is not enough to get you into heaven. It has to be by way of the precious blood. Man is not justified by faith without the deeds, but uh, he is, sorry, is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So it says that they trusted, in, this is who he spoke to, the people that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And this is fascinating. Our English word despised, comes from the Latin word, de specare, de specare, and that's made up of two words, de, which means down, and specare means look at. The English word despise literally comes from that root, to look down on someone. We know the modern definition is to treat something or someone with contempt, contempt to despise something, to not value it. Uh, in the English, um, I don't, or sorry, in the Greek, the word um, means to... Um, the word means to value very little, so not to value whatsoever, to hold this thing as of little value. And when things are despised, you look down on them. You look down your nose, and is this not the picture that, you know, anytime anyone reads of these Pharisees, you think of men that stand tall and look down their eyes. And I, I, physically, I think he would have been looking down at this public in here because his head would have been bowed, not looking up to heaven. And so to look down on, on something is what it means to despise the person who holds himself highly cannot but look down on others. If you hold yourself in great and high esteem, you are by definition despising all other things around you. Why? Because you're looking down at them. You know, oftentimes when we're talking to these children, you might see fathers, mothers, when we're talking to our kids, we don't bark at them from down here, although sometimes we do. But if it's something serious, we'll get down on our hunkers, we're eye level with them. Because why? We're admonishing them, but we're doing it respectfully. We're training them up respectfully. I don't look down at my children. I give them huge respect and that's why I want to train them up in the ways of the Lord because I expect a lot from them and so even with children we don't do that yet some adults can do that so if you hold yourself particularly highly you cannot but look down on others but this publican he was only looking at the floor he was looking down on nobody but himself he saw himself as the lowest of the low probably would agree agreed with everything that this 
Pharisee was saying within earshot, and, and, and yet God says, that's the man that was justified. Christians, we should not ever look down on anybody, be it a sinner out there or in here. We should not hold ourselves in such high esteem that, that we are haughty in our ways, haughty in our speech, haughty in our language. Absolutely not. We are supposed to be a lowly people. It says in Philippians, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself, lowliness of mind. What does it mean to be lowly in your mind? To have a mind that's low, that's not high up, that's not self-assured, that's, in, in, that's not so sure of itself that it looks down on others. How do you do that practically? Give respect to one another. Respect each other. Speak to each other. You know, the Bible says of wealthy people in the book of Timothy, be willing to communicate. And so those things are important things. You might say, oh, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. That's looking down on somebody. Oh, I don't don't need to do what you're saying, brother Soph. That's your opinion. That's looking down on somebody. I have great respect, even for the most small believer. Someone who's just come into the kingdom and got born again, I'm going to listen attentively to what you've had to say. And I've seen this in action, in operation with Keith. From the moment we were born again, that new believer has something to minister to someone. When Keith's sitting here and I'm preaching the gospel, he's not sitting on his phone just scrolling, waiting for me to have my 45 minutes to an hour up so that the real preacher can stand into the pulpit he's listening attentively he's saying amen he's saying mm -hmm. he is listening to what I have to say he's hanging on every single word why because what I'm bringing is the word of God he's not looking at the vessel he's looking at the word although the vessel is important he understands them we endeavor, uh, people in this pulpit endeavor to be men of character. And so he's not looking down on us. He would, I wouldn't say he'd have every right to, but you think if anyone in the congregation could, it would be him. And yet he does not even do that. And I think any of us that know him will understand that's the, that's the caliber of man he is. But you see, the thing is, the road to exaltation is true humility. humility. And we're going to look at that as we go on. So what was the reason of the parable? Well, the reason for this particular parable is the purpose, sorry, the purpose of the parable was to communicate that justification is not based on our ability to keep the law, but trusting in the mercy of God with lowliness of heart. Man is justified with these things. Jesus is saying, don't be like this Pharisee, but be like this publican. This publican was not only trusting in God's mercy, but he had a lowly heart attitude. The prophet Samuel said to Saul, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. He's asking him a question. You know, when you were little in your own sight, was it not then that God exalted you to be king over all of Israel? With King Saul, it was the same principle we see all throughout the Bible, which is this. The path to exaltation is true humility. The reason I start with this parable, and I'll show you another one, is because is because for us to be useful in the hand of God, we have to be little in our own sight. If you think that God needs you, you're in trouble. We've had men come through this church and they, uh, they, they're living like rogues. They literally cannot walk straight for five minutes, yet they talk about how they want to be used of God to evangelize. They, they, they know that God's used them in ministry. Do you know what? That's a shaky ground because God used Balaam's donkey to, do, to, to enact his will. God himself, it says in Isaiah, made a a worm, a threshing instrument to all of the nations around it. So God can use any vessel whatsoever, but his use of you does not mean that's his rubber stamp of approval on your life. It says with the Hebrews, as they're wandering around the desert, many of those people were unjust. Many of those people were unthankful, yet God still led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Be careful how you... Um, Judge the provision of God in your life. If you say that his provision in my life is a stamp of his approval of my life, you're in big, big trouble. Why? Because that's a deviation from the word of God. Oh, but Brother Sophie's provided so miraculously in my life, yet all of these things are missing in my life. God is grateful to his. He is good to the unthankful, it reads in the Bible. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Do not use the fact that it rains on the fact that it rains in your life in a good way as a way to say that God's happy with everything that you're doing. We must come to the word of God. We must 
be uh, led by the word of God. It says in Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save it such a one as, of, uh, as be of a contrite spirit. We know what it means to be broken hearted. And he saves one of a contrite spirit. What does it mean to be contrite? It means to be sorry. It means to be sad for what you've done. It means to be, uh, you know, uh, almost feeling hopeless in the things that you've done. But to be of a contrite spirit is somebody that's got their tail between their legs. It's the opposite of somebody that's proud. Somebody that's proud will stand shoulders back ready, but someone that's contrite is just going to sit quietly and listen. They're going to not feel like they have anything to give or anything to say or have anything to do. They're just happy to be around. They're just happy to be alive. They're just happy that they're saved. They're just happy to be with the Lord. It says in Psalm 51, 17, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. What does it mean to despise? Look down on. When you come to God with a broken and a contrite heart, he's not going to say, get out of here. Get out of here. Want nothing got to do with you. Do you know what? We might do that. People do that. Um, you know, your family members might do that, but God doesn't do that. We must emulate the behavior of God towards others. Parents, if your children come to you, sorry, don't, lo- don't hang it over them. Do not. If they come repentant, they're sorry. That doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences for the actions that they do. But if they're broken and contrite, what are you going to do? Pick up more stones and finish them off? We are here to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And it's the same in this church. If you come with weeping and gnashing of teeth in tears saying, I have messed up, I have made a mistake, what do you think I'm going to do? Chop your head off far from it because I know what it's like. God himself will not despise someone who's of a broken heart and of a contrite spirit. Why would we be any less? The Bible says in Timothy, That in the last days, perilous times will come. It says people will be lovers of themselves instead of lovers of God. One of the things it says that people will be is fierce. It says they're going to be fierce. And that's not people in the world. You can read that and say, oh, this is the people in the world. But actually the Bible says that it it is the church is going to be like that. Lovers of themselves instead of lovers of God. Fierce. This is the opposite of our Savior Jesus. He was not a fierce man, but meek and mild-mannered. Someday he will come back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when he was here on this earth, he was loving. He was the Lamb of God. He went away as a lamb led to, uh, uh, to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. When he was on the cross, he'd been wronged more than anybody else in all of human history. What did he do? Breathe out threatenings. What did he do? Get offended. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, saints of God, that we would be believers that would put that on our lips yet again, that we would be a merciful people, that fierceness was not any part of us. I will be fierce when it comes to something that comes against this church. You know, people think that um, a pastor... Has to, a pastor has to be uh, love people, and that's absolutely true. I think if you do not have a charity and agape love for people, well, first of all, you cannot be a Christian. But if you, if you don't have a real, sincere love for people, then you could not be a pastor. But to really love people, you have to hate that which hates, that which is trying to hurt those people. Same with these children. I am jealous over Ellis. I'm jealous over Yasmina. Anything that's going to try come between me and that child or that child and God, I'm getting rid of it. It's not, it's not having any avenue. I am very jealous over the unity and the peace. And that's the same. Me and Hannah were talking about this yesterday. The word of God is between me and Hannah. There's not a, there is not compromise just allowed, allowed just for the sake of her being my wife. But if there's something that's going to upset God's work in our home, then it's gone. doesn't matter if it's Hannah that brought it in, if it's me that brought it in, if it's Elias that brought it in. If there's something going to make a, try to destabilize Christ's work in my home it's not going to be there for very long I will do my utmost to eradicate that and saying to God we should be the same and so you have to love people if you want to be a pastor but if you love people you also have to hate sin you have to hate wolves in sheep's clothing you have to hate sheep or sorry you have to hate pigs you have to hate dogs all of these things are out to get the sheep of God and so, so I will be fierce in terms of those things that are trying to come against my family but, or, or, or the people of God or the work of God. But to you, to the real sheep, 
there's going to be no fierceness. It's going to be gentleness. It's going to be love. It's going to be mercy. And it should be the same for all of us in here. We should not be fierce. It's not an aspect. We should live a life of lowliness, of contrition, of brokenness before God. Our Look at this publican. He couldn't even lift up his eyes. He's not sitting there offended at what this... How dare you, Pharisee, say that about me? He's not thinking that. He's saying that man's right. But every, everything that that man is saying is right about me. And yet Jesus is justified. Look at the difference in all throughout the scripture. We see Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And look at how they always reacted to them. They hated what he said. They did not listen to what he said. They did not care for what he said. They tried to entrap him all the time. Constantly coming to tempt him at all stages of his life. They would not listen to a word that Jesus had to say uh, to them. And yet... A publican, Matthew, when Jesus says, come, it says Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. He's at work. He is a tax collector. And it says he got up and left. I don't know what administrative issue he caused by leaving a table full of Rome's money there at that table, not filling in the forms. He didn't even clock out. He just got up and followed. I would prefer, the Bible says that it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion. These Pharisees were dead lions. They looked absolutely beautiful. The publican, a dead, uh, he was a living dog. To be alive unto Christ, even in a small capacity, is to better, better than to be look beautiful on the outside, but to be absolutely dead on the inside. So God resists the proud. We're supposed to be a lowly people. We're not supposed to have high thoughts of ourselves. We're supposed to be serving one another. Our Jesus, it says that he was the chiefest minister Actually, the chiefest minister, he washed the feet of Judas before Judas ever went, uh, before he betrayed Jesus. And Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And Jesus wasn't washing his feet, muttering under his breath, how dare you? How dare you do this? He wasn't just doing it for the sake of it. He did it. Why? Because he loved Judas. He actually cared for Judas. He loved Judas. He, if Judas could have repented at that point, he would have loved for that to happen. And yet it did not and so Jesus didn't get offended, he didn't throw his toys out of the pram, he washed his feet. And you know what? He, he also said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have no place for to me in the kingdom. To be served is often just as humbling as serving. I think that was very difficult for Candace when she was ill, is that there was people doing so much for her in a physical capacity when before she was so as, as able in her own self and often the one pouring out and often the one helping. And, and yet that is an element of humility too, to be able to put up your hand and say, I need help here. I need your help. Will you wash my feet? Will you, do, will, you, will you help me in places where I don't want people to help me? Will you go places where I would prefer that people did not go? Will you touch things that I prefer were not be touched? <clears throat> and so we, God resists the proud, says in Isaiah 14, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down from the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, not the second most high, not the third most high. I will be like the most high. And what does it mean when you're the highest high? You're looking down on everybody. You're looking down on everything, everybody. You, you know, the Bible says to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And, and that's the way we should be. We live in an age where we have so much, so much abundance, so much money, so, so much room in our houses, so many cars and all of these different things. We have everything we could ever need. We don't even, maybe you might say, oh, I'm not individually that wealthy. Well, Society is so wealthy that I think any of us could never cook a meal again in our lives and we would be able to go to every one of our friends' homes and eat a meal every single night of the week and it wouldn't affect that person who's giving us that meal. That just shows how as a society we are so wealthy and yet we, and it allows us to live almost without God. We are so self-sufficient. And so when you elevate yourself above everyone else, you despise everyone. You look down on everybody. Lucifer did not only elevate himself above others, but he elevated his will above the will of God. Look at the difference between Lucifer and Jesus here. Lucifer is quoted five times saying, I will. And the contrast with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, 
but thine be done. Are you deferential? We spoke about this a number of weeks ago. Since we spoke about that, have you deferred your will for somebody else's? Have you exalted somebody else's will over your own? Have you told somebody, have you done something for someone? Have you thought, given all diligence, earnest effort as to how you can serve somebody in a capacity? Because that's what that means. Not my will, but thy will. I want to do this thing, but let's do it your way. Let's do it that way. And do it with a freedom in your heart. It says in John 6, 3, For I, this is Jesus speaking, came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. Why was the publican justified? Because he was lowly. Why is that something that God honors? Because God himself sent his son to die and Jesus himself was lowly. The Bible says being rich, he made himself poor. He could have taken all riches unto himself. When they were beating him on the cross, he could have called scores of angels to save him. Yet he did not. Why? He didn't even come to do his own will. God incarnate, one of the Trinity, God himself came to the earth, not to do his own will, but to do the will of him that sent him. And yet Lucifer stands and says, I will. This is the modern church age that we live in. They have their programs, their ideas, their uh, types, new types of Bible studies, their, all their different plans and purposes for their life, but not God's will. In this church, our, our ethos is not our will, but your will, God. We want to do the will of God here. I don't have ultimate authority here. Keith is not the head of this church. Jesus Christ is the head of his church. And the authority comes from the word of God. It says in Proverbs 11 too, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with, low, with the lowly is wisdom. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. I don't know if any of you are as silly as I am at times, but I remember the last time I ever got sharp with someone in a workplace setting, and it was years and years ago, a couple of months after I got saved in a call center, and, you know, there was this team that, that would, we'd send tickets to, and they'd do things for us, and, uh, you know, we would get it in the neck from customers if they didn't do things quickly. And they often got a bad rep because they weren't in our building, and they got talked about a lot, and people talked about how silly they were. And so I remember sending a really, as a Christian, sending a really snotty ticket uh, to these uh, guys one time. And I felt justified. I thought I'd checked all the facts, charted, checked every avenue, sent it off. And I felt, you know, kind of a little bit proud of myself. I was able to, they were wrong and I was right. And then I realized that actually I was the one that was at fault and it was completely my fault and I was going to have to tell the customer that it was actually because of me that they weren't going to have their service. And I resigned myself from that point. No matter how justified I felt, I was never, ever going to get like that ever again. And I haven't done it. I don't do it. If I feel myself in work feeling like I'm sure that I'm right here, I speak as if there's always an element of doubt. Do you know why? Because that's safe. This book of the Proverbs here, it says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. I was proud. I was looking down on this uh, people, but then come a shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. And I find in this walk, the most wise people are the lowliest. Always question, always thinking, mm, always just an element of doubt. Not in a wrong way, but in a right way. And it's actually the people that come into the kingdom first. They're the ones who are, as, who are so sure of themselves. The longer I walk, the less sure I am in some respects. The more sure I am about the word of God, the less sure I am about my own self. It says in Proverbs 29, 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. A man's pride, what's it going to do? It's going to bring him low. God's, if you're walking with the Lord and you're born again, you're going to be made low. And it's either going to be done, it's either going to be done um, uh, by choice or as by fire. It's going to happen. God's going to bring you low and it's your choice. Do you want the rock to fall on you and grind you to powder or will you fall on the rock and be broken? That's what God's looking for. He's looking for a broken heart, a broken people, someone to fall upon that heart, uh, on that rock. It says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time that he may exalt you in due time. This is where I'm coming to, saints. You know, it says there's a parable in, in Luke chapter 14. We won't read the whole thing. I'm going to cut across the field somewhat. But it says, it's a parable that says, when you go to a wedding, sit in the lowest seat. Wait, it says, actually, with shame, take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down. Sorry, but, uh, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he bade thee to come, he may say unto thee, friend, go higher. 
Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So we understand that pride is not a good thing and we always want to be humble. But when we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God, then there will come a day when Jesus calls our name and says, friend, go higher. It's like when that woman was caught in adultery, he looks at her and says, woman, where are thine accuser? It says he was looking at the ground. He stooped down. He wasn't looking at them. He was writing in the sand. I think this woman was so lowly, she wasn't looking either because he asked her the question, woman, where are thine accuser? I think she looked around and says, there's no man, Lord. And she says, neither do I condemn thee. Go. Jesus is saying to her, friend, go higher. Friend, go higher. When Jesus calls you to go up higher, even in the midst of your inability, you better do it. If every time you're asked to do something, it comes with a protracted period of having to convince you as to why you were able to do it, there will come a point where you are not going to be asked. It says in that psalm we read, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Look at that in contrast to the publican. It says, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. The problem is that often Christians can be in either camp. They're going to look into the hills before they ever looked at the ground and they're looking at the ground and no matter what you do to them, no matter how amount of controlling, they will not look up. That person is not, if you stay in that place, you're not useful to the hands of God. You're not meat for the master's use. I understand we're all convinced of our own weaknesses and struggles, but there has to come a time where God's glory is more important than our feelings of inadequate, uh, inadequately. Let me say that again. There has to come a time where God's glory is more important to us than our feelings of inadequately. Who will stand up like David and say, is there not a cause? Who will say like Peter, Lord, if, thou, if it be thou, Bid me come. Don't bid Pete. Don't bid John come. Don't bid Mark come. Bid me come. Who will say, like little Samuel, speak for thy servant hear it? Who will rise up like Moses and say, let my people go? Oh, we all know Moses was inadequate. We all know he spoke with a stutter. We all know that he didn't even have his own sheep out in that desert. He had to mind the sheep of his father-in-law, but God's going to exalt him in some day, and that day was coming very soon. Oh, that we would feel the same indignation that David felt when Goliath was taunting Israel day and night. Where are the men and women who are jealous for the glory of God, saints of God. Where are those people that will say, your word says the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. Who are going to be those people that are stones in the new Jerusalem? When are we going to stand up and be counted, saints of God? When are we going to say, God, for your glory, for, for, for thy will be all the glory? You know, it says in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly, Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In the New Testament, there are two words for crown. Two words for crown. One of them is Stephanos, which is here. The other is diadema. Both of them are found in the book of Revelation. A Stephanos is a wreath. It's what you would, uh, if you were to see uh, maybe a painting of Julius Caesar, it's what you imagine, that wreath that the Romans have. It's actually the name of Stephen, the man who was stoned. His name was Stephanus. It means to be crowned or conferred. It's a wreath that was given to someone who was, conf it was conferred on a victor. So somebody who won something, they got that crown. Whereas a diadem, it's only used in the book of Revelation or diadema. And this is a sign of rulership. So this is a more classical crown that you would imagine and it says that on G it's used twice in Revelation once relating to the beast with seven heads and ten crowns on his horns he is a diadema he's sovereign and the other is to Jesus whose eyes are as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns one is a crown of sovereignty the other is a prize saints of God we are running 
a race. We are seeking for that crown. I want to have a I want to have a Stephanos on this head, and I'm going to be competitive in doing that. Saints of God, every Saturday and Sunday, there's football teams, rugby teams, athletics teams pouring out their lives just so that they can win some junior B final that in 10 years' time they'll never get to play. No one will remember their names. That cup is going to burn and be gone someday. No one's going to care about them in 50 or 60 years. And, and yet they're pouring out their lives. They, when we used to play rugby training, we used to have to text our manager if we weren't coming. And man, if, we, if I remember missing training for a week one time and I came back to training, I'm getting it in the neck from everybody at that training. They're all giving it to me left, right and center. Why? Because I was missing training. Why? Because I didn't care about the prize that we were chasing after. We were seeking after a prize and that was corruptible. Saying to God, I want a Stephanos on this head. And if I'm giving that stiffness, I'm not letting it go. Jesus, it says in the book of Revelation, the words of Jesus himself, he says, take heed that no man take thy crown. Hold fast that which thou hast. What does that mean? Hold it, grip it, don't let it go under any circumstances. Be circumspect of people or things that might be trying to take your Stephanos from off of your head. We need to give careful consideration to make sure that no one's going to take our crown. What does that suggest? It means that someone is going to. If you're not going to do it, fine. Someone else will. If God constantly calls you and say, you are able to do it, and you say, God, I'm not, then there's a time where he's just going to forget about you. He's just going to leave it. And if you want that for your life, fine. I don't want that for my life. I'm far too competitive. I care far too much for the glory of God to allow that to happen. There, this church was formed in blood, sweat and tears in the midst of betrayals and adversities. And we didn't let that happen just so that we could just leave it to the wayside. Let somebody come and take it off us. But we want to pursue and go on. Saints of God, I'm finishing with this. I will lift up my eyes onto the hill. That man is speaking deliberately that man is determined that man is saying I will lift up my eyes into the hills what does that suggest his eyes were down they weren't up if your eyes are down that's fine it's like with Peter he said Jesus says when you are converted feed my lambs so it's fine that place of lowliness is important I'm not talking down about it I've said clearly pride is wrong humility is important those that are humbled will be exalted Peter, it was so vital that Peter was humbled in the way that he was because he would have come into that church chopping people's heads off. He would have cut off people's ears like he did to that Roman soldier. He would have done it to the sheep. Yet once he was lowly, he says, I go a fishing. Jesus comes to him and says, when you're converted, when you're ready, when your heart's right, go feed my lambs. He died a martyr's death. He didn't stay there. Saints of God, don't stay there. My question, will you lift up your eyes. My, my answer is yes, I will. I am determined. Why? Because it's not me that has to do the work. It's, not, it's God. I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. It's, that, it's, it's looking on. It's looking unto Jesus. It's awaiting for him. If you are racked with your own ability for the will of God in your life, maybe you're saying, I don't know what to do. I can't fix that issue. I'm so uh, despondent. What can I do? Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. The, the Bible says that the darker the night, the greater the noonday. When the Bible says that <clears throat> we uh, look to the rising of that sun, the, 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 the night is dark, but just for a season, but joy cometh in the morning. If it's always too early to give up, and God doesn't want you in some puddle on the floor being mocked by the Pharisees of this day, but to stand up and take the glory of God by hand, terrible as an army with banners, and to march on for his glory and for his kingdom. That's why we're here, saints of God. We're not here trying to uh, just waste away time, make living pay to, paycheck to paycheck, all oh, raise up a nice little family, have your nice family pictures, have a nice little house, make sure you raise kids that don't go to prison. God help us. If that that's all we're here for, then we better close the door. There's plenty of other social institutions that can do that and they'll do it way better than us. But we are here to display Christ in a fallen, broken city where there's people firing themselves into this river every single week. Will you lift up your eyes? Because those people won't. Is somebody going to do it? Are you going to stand up and say, do you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and serve the Lord. 
I'm going to sacrifice my Wednesdays to come and hear the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is a sword and I have to be skilled with it if I'm going to fight the enemy in this hour and this generation. Saints of God, do you want to be a useful soldier? Do you want to be useful in the hands of an almighty God? We are here for his glory. We are here to make sure that the devil doesn't crane any more ground in this city. That's why we're raising these children. We don't train these children just so we can have easier lives. We're doing it so that we can hand them over to God and that God has one more soldier in his army. One more person to fight against the enemy. Saints, it's a narrow path. Broad the way that leads to death and broad it is of the soul soldiers in the foot army of Satan himself and I am here for the glory of God to be restored in this hour it says in Psalm 24 lift up your heads O ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors and what and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory the Lord strong and mighty you might be weak you might understand your own inabilities you might face the challenges of living this Christian life or to face the challenges of sick uh, friends and family or the challenges of unsaved loved ones or the challenges of a difficult workplace but you know what lift up the gate lift up the everlasting door and the king of glory shall move in he is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. You might say, I am not like Gideon, O oh, thou mighty man of valor. Who are you talking to? Because it's not me. That's what Gideon felt. But God is, God is mighty in battle. He is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in how is God going to come in if you don't lift up your heads how is God going to work in your life if you don't want to be helped oftentimes people don't want they prefer their misery they like sitting down in the slough of despond licking their wounds thinking about how they've been wronged or how difficult their life's been or why they can't follow God oh God help us God has given us the answer here today you need to lift up your eyes you need to lift up your head you need to lift up the everlasting doors and allow the king of glory to work in your life because if you do he will do it how can the king of glory come in if those gates are not lifted up a low head throughout the bible is descriptive of a feeling of shame Ezra said I am ashamed ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee my God for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses is grown up onto the heavens but saints of God the bible says all throughout if we humble ourselves we are to humble ourselves and under the hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. For whoever exalted himself shall be abased and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. God never intended that you bury your head in the sand like an ostrich. He never intended that you just look down and, 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 and wet your couch with your tears all the day long. That's fine for a season, but there's a se for everything there's a season, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to kill, a time, a, a, a time to... Um, a time to weep, a time to mourn. There is a time to laugh. There is a time to stand. There is a time to fight, saints of God. And that is now. You might be going through a t period of difficulty, a, period, a challenging period. It's always too early to give up. Stand up. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we glorify your holy name. We praise you, O oh Father. Lord, we ask you, O oh God, help us, O oh God, to lay hold, O oh God, of these precious promises, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, Lord, to see, O oh God, Lord, your hand of mercy, O oh God, Lord, that in humility, O oh God, Lord, to be exalted, O oh Father, Lord, to be used, O oh Father, Lord, to be a, a foot soldier in your army, O oh God. Lord, I ask you, O oh God, Lord, for those, O oh God, who think that this is impossible, O oh God, Lord, I ask you that you do the impossible, O oh God. Lord, I ask you for those thinking, how can I, oh God? How can I overcome, oh God? Or if those thinking someone has taken my crown, oh God, oh Father, Lord, I ask you, oh God, that that person lift up their eyes, oh Father. Oh God, that the everlasting doors would be lifted up, oh God, and that the King of glory would move in, oh God. That Lord God, strong and mighty in battle, oh Father, Lord God, where someone has taken our crown, Lord, that we would rise up and take it back, oh God. Lord, that we would be alive, oh Father. 
Father. Lord, I ask you, oh God, Lord, that we would be the living dogs here today, oh God. Dog it as Caleb, oh God, to say, give me that mountain, oh Father. Lord, I ask you, oh Father, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit, oh God, and raise up a church, oh God, that is determined, oh God. Lord, not wet tissues in this hour, oh God, but strong, oh God. Terrible as an army with battles, oh God. Fearsome, oh God, that the enemy fears, oh God, and hates, oh God. And comes against, oh Father. Lord, I ask you, oh God, strengthen us in this hour, oh God. Help us, oh God, to have the strength, oh God, to be humble, oh God. Help us to have the strength to humble ourselves, oh God. Help us, oh God, Lord, to be strong people that can lift up the hands and say, I need help. I'm in trouble, oh God. Lord, I ask you, oh Father, help us to be sincere and honest, oh God. Oh Father, Lord, I ask it in Jesus' mighty name.